Hi, and welcome to the Punk CX podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, speaker, and general explorer when it comes to customer and employee experience. I'm really interested in figuring out what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees. So with that in mind, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, authors and academics to uncover some clues about what it takes to build this, such an organization. Now, some of you may know the podcast as the Rare Business Podcast, but I decided to rename and rebrand the podcast recently. This is for a number of reasons. First one was to mirror the title of my book, Punk CX, which was published in June 2019. Uh, two, because I'm a fan of punk music. And three, it's just more fun, right? Anyway, if this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then hello and welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com as I've now completed over 300 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then welcome back and thank you. Anyway, that's enough for me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX Podcast. With me today, I have Vasily Triant, who is the Chief Operating Officer at UJet. Hey, Vasily, how are you doing? I'm um, great. How are, you, how are you, Adrian? I am splendid, sir. I'm splendid. Now, I know that you're just about to go on um, kind of vacation, heading for the slopes and all that type of good stuff, kind of family holiday and stuff. But before you go, I want to have a quick chat about some stuff that you're up to and also some things that are on your mind so you can get it off your chest before you go away on holiday. But before we get into that, for the benefit of our listeners and people that are going to read the highlights, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about you, where you've come from, what you've been up to, what you're up to now. Sure, no, absolutely. Yes, I'm uh, I'm the COO at UJet. We're a cloud contact center vendor, you know, kind of paving the way of a, of a modern era, but I've been in the contact center space over 20 years, uh, selling, deploying, building contact centers, both on premise and starting about 11 years ago uh, in the cloud space. So I've, I've been in the, the space a while, really trying to change those customer experiences. That's how I got into the business. I enjoyed, you know, really kind of configuring systems that would ultimately affect each of our own lives, like, in, like trying to eliminate IVR menus and all the crazy trees that we sit in and, you know, try to make our lives a little bit better in, in, some, in the technology that, that I touch at least, so. Excellent. Now, I know that we, we, had a, we had a chat recently when we were setting up the podcast and we were talking about this sort of, you know, the landscape of customer experience, sort of, you know, results are coming out, improvements and outcomes and all the tech, sort of technology applied. I mean, uh, Crumbs, I think it's, was it, uh, Scott Brinker has this kind of Mar tech sort of like cloud, which is, I don't know, it's north of 8,000 different apps right now, which sort of includes customer experience, which is incredible. And we were sort of trying to navigate our way through the fog of, of, of some of that sort of stuff. And then you kind of like, like, which is sort of like, I love that because you, you started along, I have a rant or a hit list that I'm compiling, a CCAS kind of hit list. I know a series of bugbears that you kind of wanted to share. You want to get it stuff off your chest. And these are things that, you, as you say, that, that you think that CX professionals and leaders should be aware of or need to be thinking about when they're thinking about their CX technology stack and when they're building that whole kind of picture. Now, um, I know there's a list of them, um, and I wonder, maybe this is going to be a cathartic experience for you, if you just want to kind of get some of the, tell us about the list, get some of that stuff on, off your kind of chest, and also but tell us why we need to be aware about this or what questions we should be asking when we're thinking and talking to vendors about what we're getting and what we want and how that's going to work and so on and so forth. So, we, so we're, I guess, better educated and better aware about what we're buying and what we're getting. Yeah, no, that's great. And I'm glad that uh, you're, you're allowing me to get this off my chest before vacation because I'll, I'll be able to uh, ski a little bit better. But when you, when you look at the industry, right, you have vendors, that are building products, most of them coming from a legacy state being brought into cloud, or you have people that have, you know, built these newer products trying to get into this space. Because let's face it, the cloud contact center space is one of the fastest growing SaaS segments. And so people here are SaaS, they think recurring revenue, big valuations, fast growing, like there's market opportunity for everybody. So 
a lot of people, like you said, you know, 8,000 different technologies kind of coming together in this, in this ecosystem. On the other side, you had the analysts that gather information from the vendors and then, you know, either rate or give some type of reviews on these companies. But there's these things. So, I mean, like I said, I've been in the cloud contact center space for 11 years and I've held leadership positions, run product and engineering pieces of an organization. And I've also looked at over 40 companies to acquire in the space, which include, I mean, you name it, you know, I, I've pretty much seen it. And there's all these things behind the scenes that no one wants to talk about. And they don't, the manufacturers don't want to talk about them because frankly, none of them have an advantage over each other. And it's, I'll call it the Achilles heel of the space. And the analysts don't talk about it because no one's really informing them of the problems. Or if they get informed, they go back and talk to the manufacturer and there's some great spin on it. And, you know, one of the things which I'll talk about last is all these buzzwords and everybody uses these buzzwords in, in the cloud and SaaS space. And magically, if you say the buzzword, it gives you this comfort that everything is great and you should go ahead and buy the application. Um, it's these, these things, which I call the hit list, are some of the reasons I almost left the CCAS industry a little over two years ago because no one was really building products that delivered on customers' expectations. And so a space that used to be, if you go back you know, two decades when it was on-premise space, people would buy a contact center technology, implement it, it would become kind of the DNA of their customer service operation. And frankly, you wouldn't unseat that stuff for like eight to 12 years. That's why for a long time, you know, whether it was, you know, Aspect, Nortel, Avaya, like did so well because they became, you know, part of the DNA. And now you get to cloud and you find customers that are like replacing technologies either every year, sometimes every two years, every three years. And this hit list is really like what people experience after the fact. And they get sold this wonderful, sales pitch. It's like if you went to a car dealer and you saw a beautiful car, great body style and paint, and that's all you were allowed to see. And then they said, okay, you need to take it home. You're not allowed to test drive it. You're not allowed to look at the engine. No one wants to talk about reliability. And then you get home and you're like, oh my gosh, thing like I can't make it 50 miles without having to fill up in gas or it breaks down all the time. Think about kind of American cars in the eighties, right? Like no one wanted to talk about reliability until like really Toyota and Nissan kind of hit the <laughs> forefront, right? Of you know, you don't need a beautiful car, but how about something that's economical, reliable, and, and so on and so forth? Yeah. And that's frankly where we're at in the CCAS space. And, you know, why I guess I'm willing at this point to talk about them is finally there is a company out there that has overcome these. And it's, it's time to talk about them because it's hitting a lot of customers. And over the last four months, there have been so many outages and problems in the space. You know, the first one on my hit list is reliability, right? And right. reliability, you know, over, you know, again, two decades ago in the on-prem space, this term called five nines, 99.999% yeah. uptime was something that was just considered standard. And the reason why that term kind of started being talked about a lot was there were companies coming out with products that were based on Microsoft operating systems. And, and that, you know, that would get the blue screen of death. And so people would say, hey, my system is... 99.999% uptime, right? Because you periodically would have some, you know, issues just in the nature of technology. Um, but if people are building on Microsoft operating systems, couldn't achieve that because of whether it's the blue screen of death or, or so on and so forth. I'm kind of dating myself at this point. Oh. That issue has actually tagged on now to the cloud contact center space because it's not five nines uptime. And everybody starts talking about these uptime statistics but what they do behind the scenes, and this is the this is like the the hidden kind of you know hidden elephant or whatever. I don't want to say elephant in the room, but the hidden elephant is that there's carve outs. There's these blocks of time that are removed from the uptime statistic, so that if you have downtime, your calculation can still work and give you uptime. So what uptime should be is 365 days in a year. 52 weeks, 24 hours in a day, right? Seven days a week, so on and so forth. And that should give you your total time that you should be running. And downtime goes in the numerator column. What, what people actually do is they actually subtract what they call everything from maintenance hours. So I'm going to say I have maintenance windows on a monthly basis, and I'm going to give myself four hours of maintenance window, which it could be for actually maintenance, but that four hours could also be now used for actual downtime, like actually crashes in the system. 
and there's oh, other things. So they're fiddling the reporting. So oh, one, it's it's fiddling what the numerator can be, or what the total uptime or numerator, sorry, should be. Right. So you could say, if it, in a given month, if you crashed it for two hours, but you had a four-hour maintenance window available. You didn't actually, you're, you met your uptime statistic because no. you already planned for a four hour maintenance window. And then there's other things like I'm going to subtract for, you know, telco time or telco outage. That's not in my control. I'm going to subtract for infrastructure. Now, mind you, Cloud Contact Center is software today, at least, you know, for I'll call it 99% of the companies, it's software sitting on infrastructure of a cloud provider. Mm -hmm. But now I'm also going to exclude infrastructure as a, um, a, a accounting of, of that downtime. So if there's a telco hit, if there's an infrastructure hit, I'm going to exclude that from my uptime statistics. So if Amazon goes down, right, and you're running on Amazon Web Services, not my fault. I've been up 100% of the time. I and that's what goes on behind the scenes. And Everybody is dependent on these third-party services as a, as a provider of the software, but no one really wants to talk about the reliability of it. Now, most of these cloud providers have been rock solid for a while, but now we've seen the vulnerability of it as the amount of software applications within these cloud providers has gone up. Now, I mean, Amazon had two outages in the last five months. Their infrastructure, right? Now everybody's loading their software on it. I mean, that, yeah. that creates downtime. So. Um, Companies get into these things, these marketing slogans around, I'm going to give you 100% uptime. If you subscribe to our service program and your service program is, think about like car insurance, right? So car insurance doesn't guarantee you don't get into an accident. It just gives the financial means for a company to give you, you know, payment when you get into an accident or if sure. you get into an accident. So that's the game that's being played now behind the scenes. So customers think I get 100% uptime. No, you don't. You actually still have the reliability and the failures that exist in this space, which, by the way, is again is not up to the reliability standards of prem. Um, but if we go down and you pay for our maintenance program, I'm going to give you some payment. But by the way, there's an asterisk and an asterisk and an asterisk, and the asterisk says if it's infrastructure, it's not counted in here. If it's this, so the goal is, you know, you try to give this perception of stark reliability, but this doesn't, right. it's not there. And that is, it's something that plagues the space. And finally, like there is a company that doesn't have those problems, right? So that's that's a big one. And so, the, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, yeah, reliability, I mean, Crumb, so it's almost like, uh, yeah, make sure you read the details and smell the fine print and understand what you're kind of like kind of buying and whose reliability you're actually buying. Yeah. But then you also then talk about, I guess, related to all that is, you know, it's almost a little bit like cloud is positioned as being this thing that is like infinitely elastic sort of thing. You talk about the next one is like scale, because that's another thing that gets kind of banded around in the kind of the, you know, the, the CCAS kind of like space is like, going, oh yeah, we have to scale. So tell me about that, because it's like, that, I think that's a big kind of myth because people talk about, oh yeah, to play on the cloud, I mean, kind of infinite scale is at our beck and call. Yeah, so, you know, because, you know, whether it's AWS, GCP, or Azure, right? The, the pitch of any of the infrastructure providers is that their infrastructure is elastic. And it's true, it is. So the cloud, you know, the contact center providers build software and they say, our, our contact center technology is elastic, right? We can scale, um, but they, they don't. They scale to a point. And then what happens is there's, let's just say there's too much going on within a given system. And so if you really want to get scale, you now have to start clustering systems. Well, clustering systems was a limitation in the on-premise world when you hit a certain size. Now, it used to be when you hit a certain size of like, you know, whatever, 5,000, 10,000 users in the on-premise space, you create a cluster, another cluster. Now, that creates issues. It creates disparity in reporting and metrics and you know, some administration challenges. And, and some people have created these additional applications to kind of mask that administration challenge. But in the cloud space, the actual scale challenge happens a little bit smaller. And everybody has this scale challenge. Now, some companies, it might be 500 users, some it may be 1,500, some 2,000. But the reality is once you hit those, you start clustering. And the customers never know unless someone really asks the question, like, show me how your architecture is built, show me how you scale, 
and, and really get centered. There's been a few smart customers I've run into recently that have asked those questions. Right. And finally, you know, you're able to talk about it. And then they're like, wait, so you all can scale to 100,000 users. But like now we see this clustering issue or this availability issue that happens on the other side. And, and it's starting to get noticed. But the reality is most companies don't really get into the question. They just say, so you can handle 5,000 users? And everybody says, yes, because who doesn't want a 5,000 user customer? Mm-hmm. And, and, and then they start seeing the challenges behind the scenes. And by the way, as you scale and start doing these clustering things, it brings in another complexity of reliability. So it's like it now becomes a domino effect of the problems that you start to see. Elasticity in infrastructure does not equal elasticity within the software itself. Right. And you know, I used to be CEO of this company and we built a brand new context in our platform. And the idea was to be able to scale infinitely. Brand, engineers working on brand new code, building a brand new system based on, I'll just say one of the infrastructure providers. And all of a sudden we had one of our first customers scaling and at about like 700 users, like the system just you know, fell over, right? Nice. And, and then you know, they did some fixing and stuff and, and a bunch of tuning of databases and yada. But the reality was we hit a ceiling, like we hit a ceiling of scale that you could do on a live system. And it ended up being in the 1500 to 2000 user range. And the, the, the issues of scale beyond, like why can't it scale? I mean, a, a lot of people have different answers as to why. And some people say that they can continue to scale. The reality is you end up getting your, your SRE departments behind the scenes. It'll just end up clustering systems together to make things work, right. but it's a bandaid. And the large customers, the really large contact centers, it's one of the reasons they haven't made the transitions really to, to pure cloud infrastructure. And if they do say they're moving to cloud, they're typically using a legacy on-premise system stuck in a cloud hosting center. It's, right. it's the software from 20 years ago, like stuck in a modern, more modern data center, whether that's Google, Amazon, or, or something else. Right. Wow. Brums. <laughs> Who knew? And then I guess... The number three on the list is AI, AI shmei, as I call it, because it, you know, I, do, I mean, it sometimes it feels like such a banded about phrase. It's almost redundant because it's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know, tell me what you're talking about because it's such a big bucket of stuff. So, anyway, I'm not going to get started on that because I could go on forever. I'm going to leave that over to you. <laughs> Can tell me about AI? What's on your hit list? Well, so my, my hit list here is that the buzzword, the, the term AI or artificial intelligence sounds so cool from all the movies we saw through the 90s and early 2000s, and now it's in technology. And everybody says, well, if it has AI on it, it, it I need it. Like, I need to have it. We have an AI, you know, uh, you know, mission in our company this year or objective. And, but what's really behind it? And what really kind of caught my eye was, when AI really started to kind of come into the contact center, there was a company I was looking at buying and their name was, let's just you know, say XYZ, right? Right. And we were looking at them and, and they had, you know, technology that existed already for seven, eight years. And all of a sudden, about two weeks later, their website changed and their sales presentation changed. And I called them up and I said, so, so now you're AI powered? Like what, how did you release this software? Like when did you build it? Like we've been doing diligence and haven't seen this. And like, no, 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 we, we just changed the message. We've always had intelligence in our platform. So it became kind of this thing like, well, if I don't have AI, then I'm saying my platform isn't intelligent. Now, what AI is supposed to mean is not only automation, but learning of the automation so it becomes smarter. It's kind of the replacement of human, but a human changes over time, adapts to situations. And that's what AI is supposed to mean. Reality is what's happening across the space, I'll say, let's just say 95% of the time, I'm going to give 5% of the company's benefit of the doubt. 95% of the time, people are attaching AI to their name, but there's nothing different in the technology than automation technology that have existed for the last five to eight years. And so if you put .ai, .ai, you're smarter, you're worth more as a company. Like, I mean, literally, if you took two company names and you put .ai, you're now worth more as a company, but nothing's, is that anything different really in the technology? So I, I tell you what, because I, could, I sorry, I just let me interject there if I can. Um, I heard a story about somebody kind of like uh, was thinking about there's a whole bunch of startups that were pitching to VCs to get sort of initial funding and things. I think it was beyond seed. It was like first round, 
possibly, I don't know. Anyway, um, they did a review of all the kind of the decks and they said they found up to 40% of, like pretty much all of them who were mentioning kind of they had AI, they're powered by AI, so they, and they did an audit and they found about up to 40%, if not more of them didn't have any AI in the kind of the back of them mm-hmm. at all. In fact, they had a whole bunch of people in the back and they're doing the heavy lifting mm-hmm. kind of themselves. Yeah. So there was kind of like, it's it's almost a, a prerequisite. We ain't going to fund this if it hasn't got this in the, um, you know, in the ingredients, even though it might not even exist. And and so, yeah, there's, there's yeah, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors around there. Well, and, and the biggest thing is this, the, forget the buzzword, like if, if cons- customers, you know, that looking to embark on a CX journey, or frankly, the industry would just say, AI doesn't matter, like the term AI doesn't matter. Are you putting technology in that is going to have a benefit of what? What is the benefit out the back end? And show me the benefits rather than just say, like, oh, we're, we're artificially intelligent. Like, you, you're artificially a lot of things, right? It's, it's a marketing <laughs> message that has been attached to things. And rather than customers looking at like, what is the actual outcome? Did I change something? Did I enhance my customer's experience? Because by the way, there's a lot of AI technologies that happen after the customer service interaction is done. Well, if it's already done and now you're applying AI to something that's, that's now in the past, you didn't change it for the customer. Like, you have to now come back around and automate some other type of change. And so, you know, there is real AI out there. Reality is a lot of it is just marketing messages and no one dives into it. They look at like, oh, this is what they call AI. And does it really learn? Is there any algorithms behind the scenes that, you know, are doing anything more than automating the, the closing of a ticket, for example? I mean, and related to that, like, I guess the next thing is like, um, it's like the virtual agent sort of stuff because I guess we all kind of like so um and over the last couple of years is everybody jumped on the on the the uh, the chatbot bandwagon like chatbots will save us <laughs> and then they almost kind of made a bigger bigger big of a mess or bigger mess than kind of the um they actually kind of cleaned up I, I say but I, I put kind of chatbots in that sort of virtual agent sort of bucket but that's your kind of next one on your hit list right yeah look I mean virtual agents 100 percent have a place in the contact center space. The, the challenge, actually what the analysts have it right on the virtual agent side, which is there's no, right now, there's not really a proven ROI in mass, right? Outside of a couple use cases that says, this is what you are saving. Like, cause the idea around virtual agents is take your, your less skilled agents, make them more complex skilled. And overall, you should be able to reduce headcount and you know, ultimately deflection is the name of the game and it's going to save you a bunch of money. So companies are out there, everybody's embarking on a VA journey right now, VA, sorry, for virtual agent. Everybody has, I mean, I mean it's like the number one added product right now. It's, it's crazy, in a good way, crazy. The problem is everybody's embarking on it, assuming that there's this amazing ROI at the end of the tunnel. And right now there, there is no proof. Actually, virtual agent is, is very expensive when you get using, because it it's a use kind of a charge model. Um, and so what is VA? There are some good virtual agents out there that accomplish the use cases of improving customer experience. The reality is there's so many companies that have entered this space because it is an extremely hot place within the contact center market. There's virtual agent companies popping up like grass in my front yard. And what do they do? Like pop a bunch of, you know, heed off questions to someone to try to get them to deflect. And here's my biggest frustration with this space and why it's on my hit list. My mission, like me as a person, is I want to affect our experiences as individual and users. I want to change our customer experience. Most virtual agent companies out there are trying to sell technology because customers are demanding in the space and they're not actually changing the customer experience. So question Did you deflect my interaction? 100%. If you have a chatbot, you are deflecting my interaction because before I ever get to a live agent, I abandon the interaction and I end up making a voice call in or I go somewhere else because I'm sick and tired of entering the same information in order to go through the process. If you can't determine intent automatically, if you can't grab that customer, know their profile and their geolocation, and then say, I'm going to get you to a live agent because you're in one of my stores right now and I'm not going to go through this can step process, then what, what have you done? You're putting me through five extra steps 
And then at the end, it says, you know, what, what, you know, has the interaction been good? Has it been bad? Or do you want to speak with an agent? Well, I already wanted to speak with an agent, which is why I started the interaction. So now I'm going to hit it again. And now I'm going to get put in queue again, which I've already been in queue. So you deflected me. I hang up or I end the chat session and I just say, I'm just going to make a call in. Chatbot company says, hey, Mr. Customer, we deflected these interactions. And there's no connection, Adrian, there's no connection between I deflected, but I came in via another channel because I was frustrated. And they can't like... I mean, that's old, that's old school kind of like failure demand right there. I mean, it's just like going stuff that you could, if you did it right in the first time, it's a bit like um, some of those old historic sort of things where people, you know, you know, the old contact sort of thing where people get kind of like, they start sweating kind of AHT and then people are trying to get people off the phone sort of thing. And then, you know, you end up, an agent ends up um, finishing a call before the customer is really going to finish because the clock's going to counting down and they want to hit their, their numbers. And then the, the, the customer's going, what? And then they call in again. Well, they're like going, there's two calls when there should have only been one call. Mm -hmm. And it's like, same deal, right? It's just the same sort of thing. But like you say, it's like going, you're not focusing on outcomes. You're just focusing on the stuff to try and deflect it. Then people goes back to that kind of thing at the top you were talking about, the kind of reliability and the reporting and stuff. It's just not, it's all, well, it's just rubbish. Yeah, we need to connect that experience. It's, it's about us as people. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there are some companies doing some really cool stuff with virtual agent and connecting that journey and making it seamless, determining intent and, and actually getting meaningful outcomes. Mm -hmm. But the majority of what's out there is a monolithic path that bolts onto some other live system. And so you go through this path and maybe some simple interactions get solved. But if you don't have a very simple interaction, like what's my account balance, thank you, done, then you feel this transition of technology. And as a customer, you are get frustrated. I timed a, a call I made the other day. So I'm, I, I called into a company. They had a, I'll call it a virtual agent technology you know, from XYZ company. And I timed it. Before, by the way, there was no automation to my interaction unless it said, if you don't want to speak to an agent and you would like to get an SMS link to the web page so you could do your interaction online, you know, press two, which was the ending of it. I said, no, I want to speak to an agent because I know what I need to do. But by the time I got to that step was a minute and 47 seconds. So that company paid a minute and 47 seconds of time. I wasted a minute and 47 seconds sitting there listening to it. Then the agent popped up and all the information they asked me in the first minute and 47 seconds, they re-asked me over the next minute. By time, I, I literally just watched my phone. By time we actually got to dealing with the reason why I was calling, we were three minutes and one second into the interaction. Like, I mean, three minutes and a second. That's some companies their average talk time is less than three minutes. Yeah. And all because they wanted to put this fancy front end onto it was speech enabled, da, 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 da. And I was like, God, I wish I could change this, right? And like getting that company to realize their own customer's experience is, is like part of the challenge. Anyway, so enough on, on virtual agent. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's kind of fair enough. But so then the next one is like, I mean, because I think that's a doozy. I mean, I kind of like, you know, I've been working with some clients and we, uh, you know, we're talking about kind of like um, chatbots and kind of virtual agents, but they were particularly about chatbot and you talked about intents and stuff. And it was like, it seemed to me that they've, they've had success because we ended up finding a provider that rather than bringing, trying to build this all singing, all dancing sort of thing, as it ended up breaking it down kind of into these kind of like, almost like micro bots within a bigger bot, as it were. Mm -hmm. So then they can focus on getting really, really good at intents and then they cluster all those kind of things together. So it's almost like, being lots of little brains rather than kind of one big brain. And that seems to be kind of where people fall over some of the time because it's hard to break that sort of down. It's easier to architect it, architect it if it's done in a micro sort of steps. Anyway. But they kind of like, they, um, they earned their stripes in the gaming industry where pretty much everything's kind of like done digitally. And so they kind of learned kind of the, kind of the hard way when you're dealing with thousands and thousands of people and you've got lots of free customers that you have to sure. deliver to in a cost-effective kind of way. And then you've got to do, be able to do the premium service. And so they, they earned a stripes kind of that way. So they're, they're pretty solid. Anyway, 
The next one, the penultimate one, multi-cloud. This is kind of quite new, I think, because it's only just kind of come up in the last sort of like 18 months or so, kind of when it's been hitting the kind of headlines, multi-cloud this, multi-cloud that. It's Cumulus, Nimbus, kind of whatever it might be. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> multi-cloud is this kind of, I, I love this one because I, I learned, gosh, this is back in 2017, some of the dependencies that, really kind of stuck companies in a bind, but customers were looking for the ability to not be dependent either for one of two things. They don't want to be dependent on one infrastructure provider. So, you know, you know, a company building cars, let's say, doesn't want to be dependent on one infrastructure provider or they're partnered with multiple and they say, hey, I want to be able to use, you know, multiple clouds and not be dependent on any one single cloud. And so, um, or, or by the way, like I'm a Microsoft shop, so I need I need the application to work in in Azure, right? And so, well, I'm an AWS application, so what do I do? Well, reality is, so this is what I learned back in 2017. Like mm -hmm. companies all built these applications, most of them predominantly in in Amazon Web Services, because that was really kind of the first to the game and provided all these toolkits and everybody built these these software applications, including the company I was working for at the time. And I said, hey, what can we move it to? Azure, we have a customer that wants it in Azure. And, oh, well, no, we, we can't move the software over. And it, it wasn't like you could just pick up the software and just you know, make a few tweaks and load it on another computer. You, you started to realize that even though everybody has these server farms within these IAS providers, that the toolkits that they provide, which allowed all these companies to develop quicker, right? So all these infrastructure providers have proprietary toolkits that you can leverage and build faster, build your software faster, get to market faster. But once you build to them, those toolkits aren't available on the other infrastructure providers. So now you kind of lock that company in. So the idea that you could pick up your software stack and move it to another cloud doesn't exist. You literally would have to refactor your software to be independent of these services. So when someone- That reminds came, me of like mobile standards back in the day. Yeah. You know, kind of when NTT Docomo was leading the way and everything else, and people were trying to do, well, I can't remember, it was all the- CDMA and TDMA and GSM. Yeah. Like, that, you couldn't take a US cell phone, you couldn't go to Europe because Europe was on GSM and we were doing like CDMA and TDMA, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's- Same sort of, same sort of thing. Same exact thing. And so all these companies have built these applications, have, you know, whatever thousands of users on them, and they're kind of like, oh, this company has a multi-cloud need, like, what do we do? Oh, well- I'll, I'll just move the storage, like storage is independent, right? So I'll just move this S3 bucket in Amazon, I'll put storage in Azure and now I'll say I'm multi-cloud. And so the term is now coming this, you know, marketing buzzword and we can be multi-cloud. But what, what multi-cloud really means is the ability to run your software stack across cloud providers and be independent. So if there was an issue in one cloud provider or someone wanted to stop using it, your software stack should be able to, to keep running. It does not exist. I mean, actually, the in the contact center space, the first one that has been able to do this actually was us. But the idea of multi-cloud, it doesn't really exist. Like people will move a piece in there, but they can't port their stacks. They're kind of stuck. And so if, remember, we went back to reliability and uptime. Yeah. And we talked about like, well, an infrastructure provider is excluded from the uptime. Now you're also dependent on that infrastructure provider and so, like, now you kind of talk about multi-cloud, but you're really, you're, you're multi-cloud that you have a primary. And that primary, if it goes down, everything's dead, oh. right? So. But do you think that they're going to, the, the, you know, like the, the Azures, the AWSs, the, uh, the Googles of this kind of world, are they going to get to, other, and, the, and the other big kind of cloud providers that are around, are they going to get together and try and kind of develop some standards or interoper, interoperability? sort of extenders? Is that coming or is it still going to just be? I, I don't, look, I don't think so because they're all trying to gain market share. And the way to gain market share is to have some things that are unique to yourself. But I don't actually think it's their responsibility. I think it's our responsibility as manufacturers to build software that is agnostic. And by the uh, way, in some okay. cases, you may use those services. The only reason why cloud companies aren't building software that's agnostic is time to market. It's just easier Right. to leverage the tool sets. It's just easier. So right. why not leverage the tool sets 
and build faster. But as the market has evolved, as it's, as it's scaling, as we're getting to this kind of tipping point of cloud, you know, in the next few years, cloud will become a majority of the contact center seats over-prem, you're not getting to millions of users of scale and you need multi-cloud. Mm -hmm. Customers need multi-cloud and they really need to understand what it means, which is independence. And I will tell you 100%, I will challenge anybody who wants to say they are, they're not independent, right? They're literally not independent. They're 100% proprietary. And anybody that says it is just putting a piece of their software stack in these other places, trying to get the customer to think that they're, you know, now they have some other type of resilience. Like customers need to dive deeper on this one. Uh, this one's coming. This one's going to be a big one as, as the, the market continues to grow. Nice. So then we get to the final one. This is the one I think you've been kind of working up to. Kind of the, the cloud development buzzwords, cloud development agility sort of thing. This is kind of the, ta -da, the kind of the, the culmination. <laughs> well, this is one of my favorite ones because, you know, as I've been, sometimes I talk to customers or prospects, right? And, you know, one of the things that we say is, is our feature velocity is unparalleled. And when you really start to break it down, it comes down to like engineering practices. It comes down to like these philosophies that exist in the cloud space. And one of the reasons that cloud technologies are supposed to be better than on-premise technologies, right? Is time to market, the ability to deploy software real time. These buzzwords have come about and kind of back to like the AI thing. Like if I just say I'm AI, like all of a sudden I'm my product like that much better. People will say, well, my product is pure cloud. And they start to use these things like we have an agile development methodology, which by the way, exists in the on-prem space as well. It's just a software development practice, right? We have containerized the software. Containerization, that's a great buzzword. My, we are microservices, another great buzzword. Um, we have a CICD process, right? I mean, and so there's, there's all these things that kind of come about. And if you use those buzzwords magically, you are modern cloud software. There's an on-prem player in the space that has taken their on-premise software and kind of stuck it into the cloud infrastructure, right? And I've been in a couple of situations talking with people where they'll say, hey, so-and-so says they've containerized the software, built it on microservices and stuck it in the cloud. And I'm like, okay, by the way, when I was at a previous on-prem company, we containerized our software too. Like I just mean you stick it in separate buckets. It's not one big chunk of software loading on one CD, but it doesn't change the old underlying thing that the software is a monolithic stack. Microservices, people can build on microservices, but the real concept of building microservices is that you have all these little independent pieces of software that in totality work together, but you should be able to upgrade or develop on one and not affect the other. So you could build a new feature on microservice one, and it doesn't affect microservice six and seven, you can deploy it and everything keeps going. The reality is, you know, you can have all these microservices but underneath, if you have a bus kind of connecting them all, then you kind of become dependent. So until you actually get the bus upgraded, none of the microservices matter in the first place. Sure. So when people hear microservices, they hear containerization, they hear all these things, they think that the stack is modern. I would ask one question, how often do you release software? If you can deploy the software real time and you have a quote unquote CICD track or uh, process for deploying your software, why do you have maintenance windows, number one? Because you shouldn't need a maintenance window, it shouldn't take the system down. Number two, how often do you release the software? If you're running, quote unquote, this agile process, and everybody will say, we have two week sprints or we have three week sprints, whatever it may be, then you should be releasing software every two to three weeks. But most people are releasing software every six months, every year, some companies maybe every quarter. But that's almost like, it's almost like you're back to the on-prem space. Like in the on-prem world, we were getting like 12, we got down to 12 to 18 month delivery cycles for software. Well, if you're kind of in the six to 12 month, like what have you really kind of improved? And, and you're still kind of in, back to the same old process. So um, one of the reasons why I kind of landed here, and one of the things I, I, I know is our, one of our advantages is this whole idea that we actually can deploy software within two to three weeks, but the entire space doesn't do that. Right. And uh, those buzzwords, people need to get out of the buzzwords and actually start looking at real information. So. I mean, so that's kind of, cool. I love it. I mean, there's some really cool stuff in there. I mean, really kind of meaty stuff where people can go like, tell me about that. And 
you're doing this. Is that how does that map with that? Just because it'll, it, you know, it's about education, understanding, particularly when people aren't. There might be buyers, procurers, users of technology, but they might not be technologists, and they might not understand what's under the hood, as it were. So you're giving them some really, I think, really great things to think about. But I was also thinking about, I mean, thinking about sort of just time and stuff as well. Um, can you give me an example of kind of like, because I know that UJet's tackling all this, but can you give me an example of a sort of a brand that you're working with to tell me about kind of what they're doing and how you're doing and how that all kind of all this, you're trying to tackle all these kind of problems and bring this kind of to life? Because I think that's the kind of the, um, that's kind of the, the meat on the bone here. Yeah. So look, I think the, the problems around, you know, true agility in the software, you know, reliability and scale, like we, we've been tackling this with, I mean, pretty much all our customers at the core, right? We've built a product that we release software every two weeks. We don't take the system down. We have a true real-time deployment process. So you want to call it CICD. Um, and, and the system is, is built in a very modern scale. So our feature velocity pound for pound is off the charts. And we can, we, we deliver, you know, tens of features every single two weeks. And if a customer wants something like we can, it's not like, hey, it's six months out, it's a year, it's two years out. Like it could be literally in the matter of weeks so to meet this kind of new world of evolving customer experience. Scale, we auto scale, you know, up to 100,000 users. So this is, this is a non-issue. And then the reliability piece, we've taken that, we've built this mesh because we're independent of any cloud services where we can run across multiple infrastructure providers to really resolve not just multi-cloud, but this true 100% uptime guarantee, not through any type of paid service program, but literally through pure architecture and removing any single point of failure. The next part is really around evolving that customer experience, right? And we're working with brands and our customers where, okay, boom, replace the infrastructure, get a more modern interface, get, get all the data unified into this single data lake, right? A, a single system of record being, you know, their CRM is, is our kind of advocation there. And now you have to help them on the journey of the process of transformation. So, hey, maybe they bought you and they love the AI buzzwords and all these things, but now you actually have to help them on their journey. If all you did was replace an on-premise contact center with a cloud contact center, it didn't change it for you and me. We have the same process, just a new system. Now we have to help them on that journey. So we have, we have a customer, they started with us at about 300 users and we're up at, I think, 2,000 users with them now. So we've helped them with the scale, the reliability, and kind of bringing this multiple channels that they had into one. And now we're on the next evolution of their journey, which is around gathering geolocation data from their customers, gathering kind of intent data and either automating it where it's really simple and needs to be automated and quick for, you know, we've ran a bunch of metrics around what are the actual use cases. And this is the best thing, like figure out what use cases are the right ones to automate rather than saying, hey, we're just psh, automation in front of everything. And others need live interaction right away. I mean, you could think about it like in an insurance thing. If I needed a new policy or I needed to change a driver, you can automate that pretty easily. If you're in a car accident, you need a live person right away. Like that's mm -hmm. urgent situation to someone need medical attention. You know, do we have any, you know, things that are going to involve, you know, you know, lawyers or doctors or whatever it may be. So figuring those things out and we're working with customers on it. We have to outside of technology, help them on that journey. And that's the number one barrier in that CX transformation is not, is, is actually getting, helping that company through that business process transformation. Yeah, no, it kind of sounds like it's, 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 it's not just a technology, but it's, it's a, properly kind of like they're your customer they're on a journey kind of like so you journey led it's a very consultative sort of thing and kind of walk with them rather than going here's a bunch of software knock yourself out yeah a customer success manager will call you in about a month or something to do something they'll call you in a year when it's time for your renewal that's what it well is. yeah <laughs> brilliant so the city is that they're um that's Kind of great. I mean, there's so many kind of like things in there. I think it's, it's really rich um, because, as you say, it's a massive space. There's massive spend on it, and it's growing kind of like at an incredible rate. Um, but we're not, I don't think, and I think you probably agree, we don't think we're seeing the level of improvement and outcomes that we would kind of like to see or we would expect. Um, and that's where the ROI falls down, as far as I'm concerned, at like kind of a macro sort of level. 
So better decisions, better procurement, better outcomes, all of those things is, is kind of where we can want to drive to that. But that comes from having more educated kind of buyers, particularly in this space that are, you know, the people that are trying to deliver those outcomes. But is there anything else that we've that you'd like to add or highlight that we've missed out before I ask you come some more just general kind of questions? No, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing for, you know, CX professionals that are looking at this stuff is like get past the marketing presentations, right? I mean, anybody can build a market. I mean, there are some really smart marketing people in our space. Mm -hmm. Like you got to get past the pictures, the buzzwords and all those things and get actually into the real technology um, and, and simplify it. Like you said, like it's about what process are you changing for us? Right? How many steps did you go? Like one of the companies we partner with, I saw it was amazing. This guy showed me this presentation. It wasn't actually pretty from a physical sense, but he would call into a customer and map their entire IVR flow. And he was like, yeah, it takes me forever because most people have multiple menus, multiple trees in the menu. And then you kind of start seeing like, man, there's like eight trees before you get to a live agent. And for what? purpose like with the technology we have nowadays you should literally be able to automate and know where someone needs to go before they ever get there so sure. anyways um so let me ask you a kind of question because you're in the thick of it you're in the thick of the technology but you speak to all these customers and they, they want to do go on this kind of journey next level next gen sort of experiences and journeys and stuff which is brilliant i mean and you've highlighted all these kind of like the, your bugbears your hitless as it were i mean if you ask you to think about the future of service and experience, I mean, is handling those things kind of the key challenges that lie ahead or is there more? I mean, oh, kill horror if there's more. But it's like, what, what are the things, what does the future of service and experience look like from your perspective? And, and so what are some of the big challenges ahead that we think we need to navigate? Well, yeah, I think those things that we were talking about, that's just the foundational elements, you know, to, to really building a, next generation customer experience, but things are shifting. Like things are changing around the world faster than they've ever, they ever have is, and that'll continue to happen. I guess it's happened throughout history, but where things will go is the technology for sales and marketing will continue to transition over to customer experience to where we will know intent. We will know what you're, you're kind of thinking or wanting. Thinking is probably the wrong thing, but what you're wanting before you ever get there and customer service professionals will proactively reach out to you. Just like someone thinks like, Hey, it looks like you're searching information. Do you want to buy a car? We'll do the same thing, but in the customer service world and the automation will come in knowing that intent and reaching out instead of waiting for that person to call in and, and wait and queue, right? The real way to eliminate on hold times is figure out what the customers are doing beforehand and reach out to them. So, right, you're reaching out with a live interaction and really blending web and mobile together because those are the touch points that we have with everything. We're Google searching, we're you know, on people's websites, we're on people's mobile apps. There's so much rich information. We need to bring it in and look at it from an outbound touch versus always waiting for someone to come inbound, right? If every company waited for someone to show up at their doorstep to buy something, right? They would never win. That's why people like the people that are winning are the ones that are reaching out. We got to take that same approach to customer experience because we will attach ourselves to the brands who treat us the best, mm -hmm. not who made the best product, yeah. who treat, give us the best overall experience. And I can tell you from my personal self, that's the, what I do. Awesome. And so I'm thinking about where to kind of where to go with all this because it's, like, it's such a oh, it's an encyclopedia in many ways of stuff. Um, but you know how it is. It's like people kind of, it's like they're in this the customer experience is such a, as you say, it's just experience and technology is such a fast moving and ever changing sort of space. And then added on the whole, some of the societal sort of stuff that's kind of going on around us and continues to kind of go on. Um, so it all kind of feels like it's a bit of a moving target. But if I was to say to you, kind of like boil it all down for people, you know, give them, if I said, what's your, what would be your best advice? to someone listening into this that wants to improve their customer and employee sort of experience. I mean, what would you be like, Vasily says, do this. What would that be? <laughs> oh, remove any buzzwords you've gotten from people. Forget all the vendors like telling you all these technologies are going to change your experience or change your company and all these things. And literally put yourself in your customer's shoes and say, what is it that I would want? And don't put any barriers around it. 
Like think outside the box and say, what is it that frustrates me? By the way, remove it from even your own company and say, when I deal with the brands in my own life, cable companies, mobile phone operators, airlines, hotels, what frustrates me? Are we doing the same thing? What would I really want, right? If I'm traveling on an airplane and my flight gets canceled and I call in and I have to go through a queue and then someone says, hey, you know, how can I help you? Well, I mean, shouldn't they already know how to help me? Like, shouldn't they know I'm in the airport? Shouldn't they know my flight got delayed? I mean, all these, there's all this stuff that can happen. Simplify it. Get out of all these buzzwords about speech analytics and quality assurance and scorecarding and gamification and, you know, virtual agent and literally say, what is it that, how would I want to be treated? What is I want to do? And simplify that process. And then it's a journey to get there, right? So you can't, because then you'll get overwhelmed and say, oh my gosh, my, my boss is never going to let me like rejigger the contact center and do all these things. Like it's a step-by-step -step process. So what do you do first? What do you do second? There's a lot of technologies out there that are pointless to buy. Hmm. They're, they're like, they have great, they have a great uh, hypothesis around them, a great sales pitch, but you don't need them. They don't change anything in the process. Um, I mean, look, I'd be happy to speak to anybody because I literally simplify it to that level when I talk to people, but um, it's about us. Like, I mean, we have to, as, as individuals want to change our own experience rather than just sell technology to people. Exactly. So, but see, that brings me to my last few questions that I've all, that, that I've been asking on this podcast for probably ooh, more than well, nearly three years now since I published Punk CX and, and I'd be asking two, well, two questions. The first question I've been asking them is related to sort of Punk CX and I have been asking them, what one word would you use to describe a more punk approach to CX? What would you say? I would say, I mean, I kind of use maybe two words together, but I would say us, mm -hmm. right? Or you, right? And I'm going to put you as just the letter you rather than Y-O-U, but um, it's, it's us, right? It's, it's not just us being here at UJED and, and, and our jobs, but it's us, whether it's being CX professionals, us being vendors, like we have to think of a fresh approach. Like it's our responsibility to educate and help people transform customer experience space. And it, we can't do the same thing we've been doing for the last 30 to 40 years. Reality is People are stuck at companies that have been building technology that are the same processes that have been going on for the last 30 to 40 years. We have to take a different approach, which means maybe you don't have the technology. You got to go somewhere else. It's our responsibility. Um, and that us is, is CX professionals, us meaning UJET as well, to continue to evangelize the things that we can do to, to really transform customer experience. That's Ooh, I love that. Us, because it really reflects sort of that, that 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 idea, the essence of kind of punk. Because punk was like a movement, right? Yeah. It was just like a mindset and a movement. It was, yes, it was about the music, but yes, it was about the fashion, but it was also about kind of people bringing people together that didn't feel like they fitted and they wanted to kind of do something together and change things. So that's cool. I like that. And I know of probably more than 150 words I've collected over the last kind of two three years that that word is not on the list. <laughs> So it's just got added. So that's cool. I'm glad to hear that. So um, final question before we go. So I've been talking to this new book, but Punk XL, it's about experienced leadership and how I've been talking about, actually, I think we need to start talking about what it's going to take to lead in this space and thinking about experience holistically, not just customer, but employee, stakeholder, the whole shooting match. So what company or brand do you think is an experienced leader and why? Well, it's hard for me to kind of single out a company because I think the entire space has a ways to go. Like, I, I don't think anybody's doing a, definitely not a perfect job, but there's one company I'd say they're doing a good job would, and they've probably been used by probably, probably overused a little bit a number of times, but it's very simplistic what they do, which is Zappos. Right. And, I, you know, they're, you know, online retailer, easy to procure things, easy to exchange, you know, problems. Like no one argues with you. There's not many questions and it's just really simple to do business with. Mm -hmm. um, now they deal primarily in one channel or I guess a couple of channels, but it's all textual. And I think they do a great job. Like if I buy something from them, like I want to buy again, even mm -hmm. though like, you know, you exchange things and swap things out a lot. There's another company I've run into in, in uh, based out of Europe that I think, 
this has been in my own personal life, not professional, uh, that I think does a great job called My Teresa. And, you know, I've, I've interacted with them a number of times and I've just found it very smooth and, and easy. But because they've made it smooth and easy over the textual channels they have, I've never actually had to make a phone call to them. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'd leave it. Yeah, I think, nice one. you know, I'm, I'm going to say this a little bit kind of over the top while I don't think there's many other companies doing a great job at customer experience. They are doing a better job, but the reality is there's, there's a long ways to go. And the number one hindrance is people taking a risk on transforming those business processes because everybody's worried about making that change. If I eliminate three trees in the IVR, then like, and customers complain, am I going to lose my job? Is somebody yeah, yeah. Get mad at me? And it's just super easy to just keep doing the same thing different day. Yeah. Lastly, that's all I have for today. I mean, I just want to say congratulations on what you're doing at UJet, shaking things up, taking down, you know, putting the hit list out there, taking down some sacred cows, all that type of stuff. Um, and I just want to also say thank you for sharing your time and your insight and your experience with us today. And now I just probably want to say, yeah, go off and go skiing. <laughs> thank you very much, Adrian. I've enjoyed it. You have a, you have a great week. Well, that was cool. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. And I always do, actually, because I always learn something new when I speak to some of these amazing people. And it's always something new that I can incorporate into my writing, speaking workshops and other sort of advisory work that I do. Now, if you're interested in learning about any of that sort of stuff, uh, then you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswinsco.com. But one final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do tune in again soon. All the very best. Cheers. Bye.